Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear Christian friends, at about 9.30 a.m. every weekday, you could find a large group of students heading towards the sanctuary for chapel at Concordia University, Wisconsin. Our typical chapel services were like shortened church services with the things you might expect, confession absolution, readings, a sermon, prayers. But every so often, we would walk into the chapel and see our campus pastor standing there in his suit and tie, which meant it wasn't a normal chapel day. It was a hymn sing day. On those days, Pastor Smith would have a whole bunch of trivia questions that he would ask to all the students. And if you were the first one to get the answer right, you got to pick the next hymn that we sang. Talk about competition. In that place, you saw students shooting their hands up before the question was done just to get the chance to pick the next hymn. When I first started at Concordia University, Wisconsin, I did not know many of the hymns in our Lutheran service book very well. The 1030 church service my family had attended my entire life used contemporary music. So on hymn sing days, I would flip through the hymnal looking for something that I knew and not usually finding much. That is, until I found hymn number 588. This hymn I know incredibly well, and I'm sure you do too without even looking it up. On hymn sing days, I would raise my hand, hoping to answer a question right, and pick hymn 588. I thought it would be fitting to sing this song in the midst and the context of university students. We were in a place of academia, a place of studying and learning, where we were challenged with deep ideas and pushed with things that maybe we haven't faced before. We were tested on our knowledge, and it was a place to sing this song. If your curiosity hasn't gotten to you yet and you haven't taken a hymnal out in front of you, please do so. Grab one of these and look for hymn 588. Yes, in the context of a university, I thought it would be perfect to sing this hymn. There are wonderful songs in the Lutheran service book, but I think hymn 588 has the clearest words about what the gospel is and how we know about it. In just two verses and a chorus, this song helps share the truth of the gospel and has been sung by children for years. If you have found hymn 588, then you know that it is Jesus Loves Me. It is a simple song we tend to teach to children, but today I want to share how this song so clearly speaks about who we are, who Jesus is, and what he's done for you and me. So let's start at the beginning. In the first verse, we hear about little ones. There are two important things about them that Jesus Loves Me wants you to know. First, they belong to Jesus. And second, they are weak. Since we tend to sing this song with kids, I think we always think of the little ones only as children. And that's fine, but I think it's also right for us to understand that all of us are little ones to God. That means that both of these things apply to us too, including being weak. Paul even says as much in our Romans readings today, in our Romans reading today, because at the beginning of our text he writes, "For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly." So what does it mean to be weak? Often when we hear that word, I think we go first to physical strengths and weaknesses. Thinking of children, we don't need much convincing that they are physically weak. Growing up, one of our favorite pastimes in my family was wrestling with our dad. As a child, you think you have a chance of beating him, but from his perspective, he always knows that at any one point, he could end it and win. Because we were weak. That is, until all of us grew up, and he started to look like the weak one. I hope he watches this later. <laughs> Yes, weakness can be speaking about our physical abilities, but Paul seems to have more in mind in this letter as he continues on. Paul seems to be focusing more on spiritual weakness. 
a weakness against sin and death. When thinking of sin, what often comes to mind to me first is the specific actions that we take. Those sins are ones that we do going against God, our Father, and not listening to Him. It's being tempted to do something we are called not to do. So to illustrate this, think of a child sitting at a dinner table. His parents give him a piece, a nice big piece of cake, and they tell him not to eat it until they get back into the room. So the kid waits and waits, eyeing the cake, listening for the footsteps of someone's return. But as he watches the cake, he begins to think about how good it tastes and how much he wants to eat it. And so he knows that something bad will happen if he eats the cake, but he decides to think of ways that he could maybe get around what his parents have told him to do. He thinks maybe if he cuts off a thin little piece, he could eat it and nobody would recognize. And so he does. He cuts off the thinnest slice at the end of the cake and eats it, crumbs and all. But after he's tasted how good it is, he does it again and again and again until the plate is empty and there's nothing left. So as he looks back at that empty plate, he sees that he was not strong enough to withstand the temptation, and he knows that he has sinned. We are weak against this type of sin, sins that we partake in. I may not even need to say it, and already you can think of what you struggle with the most. Perhaps you do not speak well of others. Instead, you look for gossip and wish to talk to others about those things. Maybe you find yourself always looking over your neighbor's fence, wishing you had what they did, and ignoring your own gifts and possessions. Or perhaps, like the child, you just like to consume. Either food or goods. You find yourself never satisfied with what you have, and so you continue to seek more out in every aspect of your life. Whatever it is for you, the sins you commit are evidence that you are weak against them when you are by yourself. But there is another kind of sin, a sin that you have had since the moment you were conceived, which you inherited from your father and mother, which all of humanity has inherited from our father, Adam. The sin we call original sin. It is a corruption that is so deeply a part of you from birth that we start as enemies of God, Not because God treats us as our enemies, but because we turn away from him and seek to find good without him by ourselves. Original sin shows just how truly weak we are to sin, because it gains the upper hand right from the start, and there's nothing we can do to remove it ourselves. And then, there's death. I don't feel like I need to say much about death. Is there anyone in this room who's been able to stop it yet? Sure, we try to find ways to prolong our lives, but no matter what we do, death marches on. It doesn't discriminate. It takes and it takes and it takes. Since Adam and Eve, death has taken the poor and the rich, the young and the old, and many more. We know we are weak to death all by ourselves. So, we know that the little ones, you and me, are weak. But we must not forget what else hymn 588 teaches us. The little ones also belong to Jesus. So who is Jesus? Well, in Jesus Loves Me, he is the strong one. And he's the one that loves you and me. How is that love shown that Jesus has for you and me? Well, Paul tells us in his letter as he writes, God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, Jesus loves you. Despite you being his enemy, despite all of your sins, he still loves you, and and we know it because of the cross. You know it because he died, facing the thing we are weak against. On the cross, Jesus was subjected to death, just as the rest of humanity is. Yet we must remember who he is. He is the strong one. 
While we are weak, Jesus is strong, so strong that those things we cannot stand against have no hold over him. Unlike any other person in history, Jesus alone never sinned. Jesus alone kept from falling to temptation. And Jesus alone defeated death. The things we are weak against, he is more than strong enough to defeat. And he has defeated them for you and for me. Through his victory over death and sin, Jesus washes away all your sins, doing something you cannot do for yourself. And when you give into temptation again, and like the child, looking at the empty plate, see your sin, you can run to him, knowing of his forgiveness that he freely gives to you. And when you are faced with death, you can face it with peace knowing that its power has been taken away. While this life may end for a time, Jesus has overcome death. It is nothing more than a temporary sleep, as we know he will come to take you and all believers and rise them from the, raise them from the dead to be with him for all eternity. Those things that we are weak against, sin and death, are nothing to Jesus. The strong one has already overcome them. So what do we do with this news? Well, knowing what Jesus has done is a reason for rejoicing. And if you want to know what rejoicing looks like, look again to children. If you've ever seen a father give his child a gift, then you probably have seen that reaction, whether it's candy or a toy or something else. When the child gets a gift like that, they have this smile that appears on their face as they run around the room showing everybody the thing that their father gave them. They can't help but tell everyone who will listen of the gift they've been given. That is a way that rejoicing can look. Or perhaps you've seen a child on a particularly good day, like the first day of school, like my niece Vanessa. On those days, they're so excited that the smile again breaks out and their happiness is visible for everyone within a mile radius. Or perhaps... It will look like how it does for children on the last day of school. When they leave the building cheering and rush home to go to their father's and mother's house, knowing that they can now relax and do not need to fear anything. No more assignments or tests. Rejoicing looks different for all of us. But the thing that we rejoice in is the same. We rejoice every day because of Jesus, the strong one, who has defeated those things that we are weak against and brings us to him. We rejoice in the news that Jesus loves you, and he died for you in the world. So go, and rejoice in what has been done for you. Like a little one, go and tell the world of the gift you have been given, pointing them back to Jesus. Go and sing a happy song, any song, maybe even, Jesus loves me. Go. Go and rejoice because of what Jesus has done. And on the days when you, it's hard to rejoice, when you feel weak and you feel defeated, remember him 588. Remember, Jesus loves you. He told you so. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace which passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.